Welcome back to a continuation of video four, where we were working on getting game objects to animate and to script interaction with things in our FPS project. So in this video, I wanna address a few things with colliders, layers, and layer masks. So it'll start fairly straightforward and then we'll look at some computer science data structures along the way. So first up is this problem, uh, what we see on the screen right now. And this problem is, these green lines are the collider. So when I actually open this door, and you may have noticed this in your play testing. Um, when I open the, the door and I try to go through it, I kind of get stuck and I might have to like wiggle my way through. Uh, like you can, I'm pressing forward right now and I'm not going. Um, and so again, like I'm pressing forward and it just stops me. Um, and that's because what's happening is the, this collider is getting caught on the player. And we could even take a look at how big the player is compared to all of that. Um, so our player, um, we're currently a height of two, which is still kind of tall. I might drop that down to about like um, 1.6 or 1.7. Um, which makes the player a little bit shorter. So you can adjust the height of the player as needed. Um, but let's fix this, because this is not really what we want. Um, and so kind of the first issue is it's using essentially what appears to be almost the same mesh, well, it's the convex version, but it's still almost the same mesh as... Um, the, the model itself. And so I don't really think a mesh collider is the ideal choice here. So I'm actually going to take out these mesh colliders. Uh, now keep in mind, I believe the way we set this, I set this gate specific gate up is there is one on both sides. Um, so I'm actually just going to delete this one real quick. And then I'm going to duplicate the final version. So right now it has no collider, which obviously would be problematic. We could jump over it. But we can't really get over the doors. Uh, so what I would do instead is actually just insert a component for a box collider. And then <clears throat> just position it a little bit strategically. So I'm going to shrink the X size by just using a process known as scrubbing, where you click on the variable and drag left and right. And maybe I want my box collider to be over here. I'm gonna shrink it a little bit more. And so there's my collider. When I'm happy with this, uh, I could even shrink down the top so that when I put the, um, the top collider on, it doesn't collide with that. But we could, ha we could have overlapping colliders. It's not the end of the world if we do. So there is a, a component that I'm happy with. So I'm going to duplicate this component, I'm going to copy the component, and then I'm going to paste component as new, and it kind of has that same shape of a box collider and I can move it over here now so that I have those two sides of the wall as solid. And then I'm gonna insert one more box collider. I'm gonna shrink the Y on this. Oops. Shrink the Y on this new one and then move it up so that it serves as the top collider. And you can have the colliders overlap. It's not going to hurt anything. And then I'm going to duplicate this whole thing, um, selecting it, hitting Control D, uh, and then I'm just going to rotate it. If you hold down Control while you're rotating, it goes in increments of, I believe, 15 degrees. So you can make sure that you get a correct rotation. And so I'm pretty happy with how that looks. So I'm going to play test it. 
And now you should notice that we're not going to get stuck inside of kind of the edge anymore, that I can just pass right through it. Now, if we think that that's a problem where we're jumping up like that, um, we could lower this collider because as you can see, it is possible for the player to get their head stuck uh, right there. But that could also be a problem with the player with the fact that our camera might be too high on our collider. So maybe we need to lower the player's camera a tiny bit so that it's kind of on the top of my head so it can't poke through things that it's not supposed to poke through. Okay, so that fixes that issue. Now, let's continue expanding um, our usability script. We are gonna come back to colliders and layers in a second, but I did wanna kind of look at turning off and on particles so that if you have any sort of like flames or fires and lights, um, that I just wanted to expand on this idea of using an eye activate uh, interface for a script that does similar. So I'm going to create a new script called activate fire. And you could use this for lights inside of a level. You could have lights turn on with something similar like this. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to achieve here. So when we open this, I am going to steal some of the code out of my door because a lot of this is going to be pretty similar, like the git name and the, and, um, the ready. This is going to be es essentially the same. So I'm just going to copy that and move it over here. And then going back to the door, um, I could grab these variables as well as my activate method, and then I'll just rewrite the activate method. And then we're going to add the interface here, the I activate interface. So we don't have the rotate door, so we, we can take out this coroutine. And we might need to rename some of these um, activate messages. So this would be uh, turn on fire or maybe start fire. And then this would be stop fire. And then we don't need a rotation amount. But what we are going to need um, is essentially what we're going to be triggering with this. So if we're going to put this script somewhere, we're probably going to put the script on the, the fire pit because that actually has a collider we can interact with, not the fire itself. So we're going to need a game object that we can link into there. So this will have a particle system because I, I actually want to be able to turn off and on a particle system. And I'm going to also include a light so that you could potentially link multiple items to this toggling behavior. So this will be relatively simple in terms of our activation. So if it's ready to activate, um, and then if it is activated false, um, so this is not the door is off. This just means object is not on. And this would be if the object is on. So in, in the case of a fire, um, if the object is turned off, we will want to start the fire. So we would say fire particles 
dot play and then that would play the created animation for it and then the light fire light dot enabled equals true and then activated true and then we would just do the opposite for turning this off so we would say fire particles dot stop and then light false Now, we don't want it so that the player can accidentally spam this. So we are going to bring back the idea of a coroutine, and we're going to use one of the most widely used coroutines, which is another reason why I'm pulling up this example. We're going to use a coroutine that pauses for a set number of seconds. So we're going to use an I enumerator, and we'll call this set ready after delay. So this is a coroutine method uh, to pause for x, well, delay number of seconds, and then do something. So this is, like I said, this could be used for a lot of different things. Um, it could be for cooldowns with abilities um, or just other types of timed uh, uh, triggered events where you have something happen and then you need to wait five. I wouldn't do it for long durations. You, you might want to find like a different way to handle that. Um, but for shorter durations, this seems ideal. So we're going to yield return a new wait for seconds. So essentially what happens is it gets called and it's going to wait um, that many seconds because the coroutine is going to activate every frame essentially. Um, and it's going to keep on waiting until these two seconds are finished. And then we can set is ready back to true. And then we can trigger this right here. After we've turned off ready, we will start the coroutine. Set ready after delay for, I don't know, like 0.2 seconds. And that way the player has to wait for a little while um, before they can toggle the fire back on so they can't just sit there spamming the key uh, which could maybe potentially bug out unity who knows um, if you're starting and stopping a particle system too rapidly all right so we're gonna hit save on this and we're going to attach it to the prop brazier and so I'm going to take this activate fire and drag it and drop it onto here. And so that is this one. And we need to link the particle system and the light to it, which happens to be the same object. So it's this fire object. So we're going to just drag it onto both. So th this object actually has both the particle system as well as the light here. So we could, um, we can activate two different like components to this object. You could have two different objects completely if you wanted to. All right, so the other one is over here and we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to link in its the fire one here. And for the sake of argument, I'm going to go back to this other one here. So it needs to be checked to be is activated because the fire is already started. But for this one, I want to stop it. So we'll hit, um, where is the start? Well, this one might be a little bit more complicated. So we'll turn off the lights. Uh, and then we need to turn off the emission. Uh, 
There's an enable button on this thing somewhere. Ah. Play on awake. Alright, so this one starts not enabled, this one started enabled. So when we push it, um, you can see it turns off, and it knows on our very first push to do that, turns back on, then here, turns on. And it knew to do that um, correctly from the given states. So you could do this to put some dynamic lighting in your level, uh, where you could start things All right, so, so far so good. We've managed to kind of play around with some extra usage of the activate script, which we'll see a lot more in the next video where we start animating the cart. Um, but the very final thing I wanted to look at in this video was being able to give the player the ability to push rigid body objects so that we can still kind of interact with the world if we want to. And then also some of the collider shenanigans that we can do uh, to make that work out uh, a little bit nicer. <clears throat> so we're going to work with this second minecart, or you could use a you could use just a regular cube. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, we just want to look at being able to push things around. So this minecart isn't going to need anything except for the addition of a rigid body component so that it can be interacted with, it can be pushed around, um, stuff like that. So the player is the player can bump it. Now, I would be tempted to redo the collider on this. Um, so I'm going to also take out the mesh collider and just replace it with a box collider. Now the box collider is smart enough to try to encapsulate the object and I think it did a fairly good job. Um, we may want to lower it down a little bit uh, because the, the way that this thing's going to going to settle is its wheels probably will go through the track a little bit. Yeah. So Perhaps I'm going to make this a little bit bigger of a box collider. All right, that looks good. So it's got a rigid body, it's got a new box collider so that physics wise, it should be a sim simpler shape and we're going to give the player a script that will let the player push this. Um, you can see it's kind of crooked right now, and that actually has to do with the fact that the track, its collider isn't exactly flat. And so that's a problem too. You might want to remove that and give this a, you know, a flat box collider. And then again, decide on what makes the most sense for the height of the collider because like I think that collider is probably too high and so I would shrink this down so that that would be the collider problem is then you've got this thing here that has a similar kind of weird collider So we'll just duplicate that out. Now this, <laughs> the curved track is a separate beast. Uh, this is going to be a little bit trickier for us to get a collider to work on that. Um, we could just do a series of box colliders. Uh, there's not really, maybe a cylinder collider could work. Because again, a, a mesh collider is going to be too to, to not, not flat. So potentially, oh, is there not a cylinder collider? Um, I'm sad. So, but you can see the problem with the box collider of how big it is. Um, 
And then also, unfortunately, you cannot rotate uh, box colliders. You could try to edit it, but you can't. It's a it, it it has to stay a box. So there's there's not a whole lot you can do with it. Um, aside from potentially putting a lot of really small boxes together like this. So, I mean, the correct solution in this case, um, honestly, is to learn how to use Blender and make your own um, very simplistic flat collider so that um, it would be very easy for the player to uh, navigate that. So you might want to also consider the height of this collider, how this is um, 0.08, and so we might want to consider having a similar height on these because that way the object doesn't pop up into the air when it transitions from one object to the next object. Uh, you want the colliders to be as essentially as smooth as possible so that when we when we push this cart down this track, uh, it doesn't just pop pop because there's a bump in the road or something. Okay, so we, we've given this a rigid body. We've kind of fixed the track, but as we saw, the player cannot interact with it uh, because the player doesn't have rigid body. It, we're, we're managing all the physics kind of ourself with our FPS movement controller. So we're going to create a script to essentially give us the ability to push things. Uh, we could build that in to our FPS controller if we want. So we can just pull this up. And we can add um, some additional code into this uh, so that we can handle that. So let's try to find a place where I would want to put this. I would say this is, counts as interaction. So this would be the strength of my push. So we'll have a public float strength. And this is the physics strength, um, a relatively just arbitrary number of how strong I can push things. Uh, and if you want to be kind of um, silly about this, we can even use what's called a range to enforce that this value will be within certain numbers. So I'm just specifying the default there. <clears throat> Next up is I need to, so we're gonna use a layer mask to determine what I can push. Now layer masks will require a little bit of explanation in a second. So we could, if we wanted to, put all the pushable things on a specific um, layer. Uh, essentially, if it's, we're just going to have push things on the default layer. Remember your escape characters for, um, because that's a, essentially a string. It's, it's going to be the option from a drop down that we pick. All right, so we've got push layers and we have a strength. Now, the pushing. And, and let's put a boolean here to enable it and disable it. Uh, 
And it might be worth having this because we could turn that off and on. Maybe if the player is stunned or for other reasons, the player can't push things. So we added these three new variables under the interaction tab. Oh, sorry. These three variables, uh, the can push, the layers that you can push and how strong of a push we have. So I'm going to jump towards the bottom. So hitting save, I'm going to jump towards the bottom and just add it after the move part. So this is going to deal with a type of collision. Um, there's a built-in method for this called on controller collider hits. Fancy built-in one. So whenever anything with a collider hits this, this method does get called. Um, I mean, we could just very easily test this and just say debug.log um, hits.collider.gameobject.name and we can just see what what's actually hitting us at any given moment. So when we hit play, whoops, syntax error. Um, oh. I should write that. Uh, line 43. Oh. I'm missing my closing bracket. On line 34. So, all right. Jumping back down to here, um, we should be able to see a list of names. You can see terrain down there in the bottom left. Um, you can see the names of the wall. So everything that's hitting me is is triggering this me method, um, and so we need a way to um, determine what we are allowed to push uh, and then control that. So let's get into this. If we can push, we're going to call a method called push rigid bodies. And then we're going to pass it hit. This method doesn't exist yet, so it obviously has an error. Okay, so this is going to be the method where we handle um, pushing things. So first up, let's get the rigid body. So we're going to have the variable rigid body body equals hit dot collider dot attached rigid body. So the thing you can read the tooltip, the rigid body the collider is attached to. So this is going to get if there is a rigid body with that. Uh, you can already see from the tooltip that it's re recommending if body is not equal to null. So we are going to do something with that. If there is no rigid body or it's a kinematic rigid body, which are rigid bodies that are moved only through scripting, then we don't want to do anything. So if body is null or body is kinematic, now this is using, then we just return. This is using short circuiting. So if this is true, we're not at a risk of a null pointer exception running is kinematic because if this is true, it will short circuit this if statement. Additionally, if the thing is too far below us, then don't push. So if hit dot move direction is less than negative three, well, negative point three, then we're just going to return. Again, don't, don't, don't do anything. We've got to specify why. Now the part that's going to be the most weird um, 
of all of this. So first, let's. I, I need us to see the setting here. Do you see where we've got our interaction push layers? And it's currently set to nothing. And then we can pick specific layers. Actually, we can pick multiple layers. So we can choose multiple layers to push on. This is a layer mask. It's the ability to select multiple layers. We'll kind of see a little bit more on that in a second. Now, objects are only on a single layer. So for example, player is on layer named six. Uh, the cart is on layer zero. So a, a thing can only be on one layer, but yet we're creating this layer mask data structure that allows us to actually you know, select multiple things. Um, we only want to have default selected because we don't, right now we only want to push things that are on the default layer. So time for us to see the magic of layer masks or just what are called uh, bit masks in general. See if the objects so if so we call that push layers dot value single ampersand not the normal double ampersand um, open parentheses one bit shift bit shift left um, hit dot game object dot layer and you can see the autocomplete is familiar with this, is not equal to zero. So that does require a little bit of explanation. I'm gonna finish the code, then I'm gonna pull up uh, MS Paint to give a little bit of a background on that. So we're gonna calculate the, the push direction from the move direction. So it's gonna be a vector three. And we're just basically kind of stripping out the, the Y value of the movement of the collision. And then we're going to apply this force. So we're gonna apply push direction times the strength. So technically the faster you're moving when you hit something, your strength will, will it'll, it'll magnify the, the power of that push. And this is an impulse push. So we've basically given it a 20% boost to the um, amount of movement we had. So we can hit save. And this should work. This is now part of the player's FPS controller script um, where it's able to push things that have rigid bodies. Has no effect on things that don't have rigid bodies. So this cart is unaffected, but this cart, we're able to push it with kind of standard silly game physics applying. So let's dive in a little bit to what this code right here means. This is probably a very interesting in powerful computer science concept. So what's happening is there is this, if we, if we take a look at push mask, um, or push layers, that's our layer mask. So what the layer mask is, um, I'm only going to draw it for like however many bits I can fit on here. So we chose to activate on the default layer. This one here means default. And 
Now, if we go and look, there were other choices that we could have picked. Um, there's transparent FX, ignore raycast, and those are all layers. So you can see this is just purely a list of layers. So this was what transparent FX. This was like ignore raycast. Um, this one was unused, so that one didn't have anything. This was like water. Yeah. This was UI, and this was player. So the layer mask is a selection. It's it's a binary selection thing that look what right now looks like this. It would actually be equal to the value of one. Again, this is in binary. Um, this is you know a binary value. If you were to print this out to the console when we had when we did the command push layers dot value, that's equal to one right now because that's selected. If we selected this, what would happen is then you know this would become a one, and so it would be equal to three at that point. Uh, we could test that really fast by just doing debug dot log push layers dot value and we should see that it should be printing out three. It'll only print that when we hit the cart though. So we gotta go run to the cart and, and tap it. See in the bottom left it printed out a three. Um, and so each different part of the layer mask So each part of the layer mask here um, is, is a different thing. And, and if we included that, it would have been three. Now, what the rest of this code is doing, um, this part here, this bit shift, it's taking a one and shifting it equal to the, the, the layer that it's on. So when it's shifting, by the default layer, if the object happens to be on the default layer, it's going to shift it zero units. So um, it's going to have a one here. Now, if it was on like the player layer, you know, player is layer six, it would have shifted it to the to the left uh, six units. So um, player would have been this value if it was because it would have been shifted um, left six, but it was shifted zero. So we get this value. Then we do the bitwise and which then takes all of these and does a logical and onto their values. It's like this and I've drawn. And the resulting value, you know, zero and zero would be zero. So these are all zero. But we have one and one. So that would be a one. And so because the layer that it's on is overlapping with a layer that's chosen in the, in the layer mask, it was not equal to zero, meaning this thing is selected from this layer mask. And that's actually what this command is doing. And I, I originally struggled when I was putting together this code if I wanted to get into that. But honestly, this is the most efficient way to handle layer masks. Um, and so it's that's I wanted to explain what was actually happening behind the scenes. Layer mask is a way to select layers, but the layer of a thing is just purely a number. So this command here is what's actually converting the number of the layer into this essentially the same data type representation that the layer mask is in. So then we can search to see if the layer mask has that value selected. And that's what's happening. A little bit of an explanation of layer masks there. Um, and you saw that we were able to then push this. 
So the last thing I wanted to do for this video, the last little gimmick, is if we wanted to give a little bit of guidance to this cart so that the player can only push it along a specific way, we could add more colliders and have these colliders ignore the player. So for example, I could create a collider that looks like this. And maybe I'd want to make it a little bit taller. Um, and then duplicate it. So I'm going to copy the component and then paste the component and then just move it to the other side so that the minecart must be pushed along a specific forward way. Now, this will block the player because they're colliders. So if I come running up to here, I hit a collider and I'm, and I'm being blocked. I mean, despite the fact that it's trying to achieve letting you push the, um, the cart. But what you can do per collider is actually tell it to exclude specific layers. So I could tell it to ignore the player layer. And this, this is a layer mask as well. You can see that I'm able to select multiple layers. So I can tell it to ignore the player layer. Now Unity has a built-in layer masking. So it knows that during this collision, the player will be excluded from colliding with that collider. And the result that we can have is the player can pass through it, but the cart can't. Well, in that case, the cart did kind of get shoved, but you can see that the cart is colliding with it. So maybe I need to put a roof on it. Um, but when I test this, if, if I was a little bit more careful with how I structured this, um, we would be able to make a path so that when you push the cart, it can only push um, in an appropriate way. So you could get a little bit more creative with that. And technically, you could do this with invisible walls. Um, and just have walls that the player doesn't collide with, but things that you want to be able to push, like if you wanted to be able to freely push this minecart down this path, but only push it down this path, you could kind of box it in with colliders like that so the player can't push it off of the path, but the player doesn't get hit by those colliders. So in the next video, we're going to animate the cart. So instead of pushing it or, um, manually setting up the rotations like what we did with the door, we're going to then be able to animate world objects as an interactable. So thank you for sticking around for this video. This is a little bit of extra information about how colliders work, uh, which will greatly enhance your ability to design levels. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in what I will call the fifth video.